great. So uh, it's, it's unbelievable that this is uh, the last day and, um, and, and we will miss all of you. But before we depart, um, we have uh, the star panel. And, uh, and one of the great things about Asia 21 is there are so many stars uh, that I really get to do like a panel of six people in 90 minutes. Uh, so uh, really looking forward to keeping it kind of crisp and getting your input. Um, I, I want to get a pulse of the room uh, first as we go into this topic, because I know there are so many people with different backgrounds. Um, who uh, in the group here is, uh, works in the technology uh, industry? Can you just raise your hands? Um, who's working uh, in a field that's currently undergoing major digital disruption? And who hasn't raised their hand? <laughs> and Asia Society. <laughs> okay, we need, we need to work on that. <laughs> um, but uh, no, it's, it's, it's actually striking how, how many people are, are in the field uh, or are working in fields that's undergoing that change. Um, a separate question, how ready uh, and at the frontier uh, do you feel your work is uh, in driving this digital uh, disruption as opposed to being maybe a passive adapter uh, to change. Those who feel that their organization is at the frontier of this change, uh, raise your hands. Surprisingly low number of people. Um, those of you, a personal question, how ready uh, and equipped do you think you are personally uh, in your knowledge uh, and your network uh, with the technologists that are shaping this world today? Those who feel that you know the fields uh, and that you have the network. Uh, raise your hands. Great. Uh, and, uh, and lastly, um, do you raise your hands if you feel that the country that you're primarily residing in today uh, is at the forefront of being adaptive uh, to this change or shaping this change. Uh, which country is that? South Korea. Uh, others who raised their hands? Rahil? India. India? Yes. And the, China? Any other countries? Put in a plug for the world US. US, yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. So um, I, I think uh, one thing to note uh, about Asia Pacific, which I think sets this conversation up, uh, is um, that it is one region, if we include the United States, uh, Together with the United States, Asia uh, is the place where the most valuable technology companies are. Yesterday, I was reviewing the top 15 most valuable technology companies uh, in the world. Uh, there's only uh, the US and Asia represented, except for one uh, exception, uh, the 13th uh, company, which is uh, SAP. So Europe has only one company uh, represented in the 15 most valuable uh, companies uh, in technology uh, in the world. And if you look at the top seven, uh, two of them uh, are from uh, China uh, and five are currently in the United States. Uh, what's most striking uh, news last week uh, was that Tencent overtook uh, Facebook uh, in terms of its market uh, valuation. Uh, and when we consider uh, the growth of the market uh, and the rise of uh, India uh, and other, Indonesia and other countries. Uh, this is going to be the place where not only the Chinese, uh, but some of the largest Japanese, Korean, Taiwanese companies are in that top 15 list, uh, and they'll grow larger uh, in the home markets. Uh, what we haven't really discussed uh, is how societies in Asia will cope uh, with that change, uh, and how some of the standard setting uh, around the new technologies uh, will be competed uh, around the world. Um, so that's what we want to uh, get into uh, in this conversation. Um, what I really liked about how Penny kicked off the session was um, kind of asking about the people before we dive into the topic. It, it's actually quite illuminating uh, uh, what people are passionate about. So maybe a, just a quick round uh, across uh, the panelists. Uh, what's not on your CV that you're passionate about? Please, just maybe just go around this way first. Alan? Well, good morning, everyone. Is, is the mic on? Press it. Two seconds. <clears throat> yeah. Is it working? Yeah. I think. Yes. 
Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, well, what is not in my CV? Actually, I'm very passionate. Whatever can have a positive impact on the humans' lives, so it motivates me to go. Uh, so that's, that's the thing. Maybe it's not in my CV, and that's the only thing I can wow. say. Uh, what's not on my CV is uh, my baby girl's uh, name. Uh, it actually means means uh, and stand and practice. But I realize I. I, I just made a bad example. I didn't understand my flight schedule. Although, we, <laughs> although with all these fancy mobile apps, I have keep me keep on reminding me that you have a flight to catch up. But then I still miss the flight. So I guess, <laughs> yeah, I didn't understand, so I couldn't practice. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, I think what's not on my CV is I'm actually quite passionate about um, children education. So uh, me and several uh, friends, uh, we have a uh, pre-kindergarten um, sort of like um, preschool mm. uh, for underprivileged children um, in Indonesia. We started with one preschool. Now we are growing to 30 preschool. It's totally non-profit. Um, so, you know, we're actually channeling our salary into this and using our network to expand. Uh, hi everybody. So uh, I, ha I have no idea what's on my CV. I've not actually seen it. Uh, so uh, I'm hoping it, uh, it's pretty expansive. I presume what's not on it is uh, my children. And uh, so that's what gets me ticking. That's what gets me up every day to do what I do in government uh, in terms of public policy because I want to make sure that uh, they have a future that is pretty bright. And they're 12, uh, 9 and uh, 5 and a half. So... Uh, They've got a bit of growing to do, uh, and uh, I've got a bit of public policy making to do as, <laughs> as well. <clears throat> hey, I'm Paul. Um, in terms of resume, I guess the, the hidden thing, it's not really all that hidden, but I'm a massive data geek. I love uh, anything analytical, um, data, and hopefully we'll talk a little bit more about that, but like, you know, quantified self, all that sort of stuff. So, uh, so I guess we'll be talking a bit about that hopefully today. Um, I love jazz. I used to play jazz trumpet in uh, the bars of Sydney with a ragtag bunch of bandits. And uh, I miss it. I would like to go back to music at a later chapter in my life. So uh, I think the jazz concert's on for the next, uh, next annual summit. Um, and what, what's striking about that answer, actually, uh, um, we didn't plan this, but um, you know, three people talked about their children. Uh, and I think a lot, you know, uh, part of what we want to discuss is what kind of future are we creating with uh, digital technology? So just kind of shifting gears, um, how is technology disrupting the sectors that you're in? Uh, or how are your technology companies disrupting society? And, and also, how is the region and the country getting ready? So maybe with the sectoral change, um, uh, Alan, um, can you talk a little bit about um, maybe you know, in just two or three minutes, what are you using technology for to change healthcare? You know, and, and what kind of changes, disruptive changes, can we expect through the work that you're doing? Well, uh, we are active in healthcare, and we use AI uh, basically to detect heart disease in an earlier phase, even if the patient doesn't have any symptoms. I would say at the beginning, what is the definition of disruption, basically? How do we define disruption in any sector? And healthcare is one of the most important and vital uh, sectors because it's, it directly uh, affects human beings' lives. And I would say that technology and specifically AI has been uh, very important for the people in the sector. And uh, uh, everybody from the medical experts and uh, even the, the, the different stakeholders, even the governments, they realize that uh, by unlocking the AI full potential, they can address the challenges that they're facing in the sector, basically, instead of just stopping them. On the other hand side, uh, they're providing or basically they're preparing uh, an environment that they can deal with the different stakeholders that they, they can provide uh, these type of services everywhere. And they basically 
the people in the sector, they use every day, they just bring something new, although like AI is a very buzzword, everywhere they use that. But I would say in healthcare, it's been quite successful also. And uh, on the other hand side, uh, I would say we have the technology, but uh, sometimes we go in the wrong direction. We just want to develop technology. We have the technology. It's better to focus on the technology that uh, what we're doing, we can extract uh, the potential, the full potential of the technology, and healthcare was not an exemption. So uh, there has been huge improvements, especially from Europe where I'm coming from, uh, a lot of startups uh, just active in the sector, and we see brilliant uh, businesses, uh, SMEs, NGOs, or that they're active. Uh, they're working at the intersection of technology and healthcare, and uh, I think that is the result. Because, uh, like, I was in a conference last year. Uh, there was a statistic that 85, more than 85 percent of the VC's money uh, in 2016 went to the health tech startups, actually. So, yeah. and, but Alan, in terms of your um, early diagnosis yeah. work, what will AI specifically allow us to do? What's the different kind of outcome that uh, you can see that you're driving? Maybe I can explain the way that we approached mm. uh, the challenge, so it can clarify basically the situation maybe mm. better. We employed uh, an engineering fact uh, and we approached the situation from the engineering point of view because I'm an engineer by background. I mean, when you have a system, for example, the system, it has different parameters that they're working together. When a parameter changes the behavior, it affects the related parameters. If we bring this fact to the human's body, so human's body is a complex system, but it has still the nature of the system. So it means that the different parts of the body, they're working together that can make us be alive, actually. When, what is the definition of the disease, actually? It means that one or more than one body part, it doesn't work properly. So it affects some of the related parameters. So what we're doing, basically, we look at the related parameters and we use the existing data. We don't need something extra. We use the existing data, and that's the point that AI can help because we can train our algorithm, which is based on machine learning, uh, that can be uh, that can have a higher uh, accuracy and be on the safe side, basically. So this is the way that we think that we interrupt. Uh, the challenge that we're facing in, in, uh, within the heart disease, basically. I see. And, and that, that will, in the end, allow earlier detection or yeah, better outcomes? Or? Uh, well, uh, when, uh, during the two days diagnostic process, what happens is that uh, when, like, when you feel something, first of all, absolutely, we go to doctors, they examine us, they take a blood test, ECG, and to make sure, they send you for angiography operation. Uh, so the problem with the angiography operation is that first it's invasive and it's expensive. Uh, on the other hand side, and according to the research, more than 50% of the time the angiography is not necessary. So basically this unnecessary operation, it translates to 100 billion euros in additional cost each year. And to just give you an insight how big is the number, it's enough to cover the whole budget of Sweden in 2017, this number. So, Basically, what we can do also, we can uh, provide a decision support tool for the doctors at the primary care to eliminate the unnecessary operation also. Got it. Okay, great. Perfect. Chen Hui, also in the healthcare area, um, how are you changing through technology healthcare in China? Uh... Uh, yeah, also from the healthcare background, uh, I want to share my personal experience. Before I, I started the startup, I, I was working uh, at Harvard on the rural healthcare reform in Western China, Western part of China. I, I was in charge of uh, rural doctor training and uh, health quality surveillance at that time. I remember that was 2010, and I was... Uh, doing the field trip in the, in the rural areas of western China, and I talked to one of the director of this township health center, and, uh, and surprisingly, he was telling me all these fancy features of a new iPhone 5 coming up. So <laughs> I, I was totally shocked at that time. And um, 
because at that time we were trying to invest in money to uh, bring a, a PC to every rural doctor's clinic. But they were already talking about smartphone at that time. So that's when I, I realized, okay, they, this is happening and uh, it's, it's beyond healthcare. And uh, this is the huge thing actually uh, change uh, how people practice their their career and how they access information as uh, as Alan has suggested and meanwhile also I think it actually affects uh, how people especially for doctors to uh, to interact with uh, with each other and also how they interact with patients uh, I think recently um, I think it probably last year uh, Kaiser published their their uh, statistical data that they already have 55% of hospital uh, of uh, doctor and patient interaction online. That means over half of their patient doctor interaction happen online rather than offline uh, inside the clinic. So yeah, like I. I, I was talking to this, well, I was trying to hire that physician before coming here and she was telling me that she had this terrible 24 hours, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the 24 hours emergency uh, care um, uh, visit that she has to be on call there for, for a whole day. So she was asking me how you practice that in your in your service, and I told her, okay, you can basically do that in your home with with your smartphone. And uh, so that's that's how things change. Um, that's actually affecting a lot in in healthcare. And also, I think recently in UK, um, like everything is free in in UK system, or you can you can get free primary care uh, in, in the UK system, and people used to think, okay, uh, patient won't pay for anything uh, extra. But surprisingly, like, uh, there's a company launching their, their uh, per, per case charge for an uh, online uh, visit, uh, for, for a doctor's visit, and people actually pay a lot for that, and, they, and their numbers are keep on growing. So. I think this is, um, yeah, just in general, I think it's, I can see how technology affect uh, personal practice and also how they access information and meanwhile, how they interact with each other in, in healthcare. Great. Uh, Shinto, you're, you're on the disruptor side uh, mm -hmm. of things and, um, and Google probably represents one of the most uh, kind of transformative companies companies in terms of how it's affecting people's lives in different group, uh, areas. And, and if you look at Alphabet, it's even broader uh, in terms of your portfolio. Um, from a, your vantage point, like, you know, how are you, you know, as Alphabet or Google, uh, looking at changing society? And, 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 and how do you see the challenges, particularly in your government relations work as well, um, uh, the coordination and the readiness of society to really reap the benefits while avoiding many of the justifiable concerns that people have about privacy or the pace of change or nature of work uh, or some of the technology companies just kind of rolling out technology without necessarily thinking about some of the implications. Thank you. I think this is uh, this is a great time for all of us uh, to be in because again, you know, this is very disruptive. But again, every disruption is actually what brings us forward. Oh. Now, I can talk about Indonesia a little bit. Um, I think it's um, in Asia. I think when we talk about Asia, um, this is a very young population. Um, talking about Indonesia, about sixty percent of our population is actually considered young. Um, the numbers of first-time voters is increasing over time. Next year, we'll be having a national election, and 43% of first-time voters is going to vote for the first time. These are the uh, mobile first generation. These are the generations who doesn't even remember what it's like to live without internet. Yet, if you're talking about the politicians and you're talking about the policy makers, most of them are people who live without internet. So it's very... To me, it's very interesting because I used to work for government, so I understand how they see technology and how they see this disruptive technology as 
really bothersome to how they usually conduct business. Civil servants in Indonesia are a job for life. So for them, this is, you know, they have to rethink everything. They have to unlearn everything. The traction and, um, of course, the clashes between it is, also, uh, is very interesting. We see some uh, public servant or some politicians, they all understand that they have to embrace, and this is inevitable, that this is coming, and some of them are ready to adapt. Um, Indonesian president, for example, um, he is actively embracing you know, uh, the new methods of communicating. He uses a lot of social media, he flocks uh, with the head of states, and that actually really increased his popularity to the first time voters. So some of them are, can you know, really carefully uh, do this. Our Minister for Maritime Affairs, for example, Indonesia is an archipelagic island um, uh, countries uh, for people who probably haven't um, um, been to Indonesia. And our maritime uh, ministers actually uses this technology to monitor illegal fishing. And now it's uh, the same method has been um, uh, Thailand as well as Vietnam is trying to work also in that. And it's, it's great because technology actually allows for more transparency and accountability of public policy making. In addition to be, um, you know, a, a country with the largest, with one of the largest uh, populations as well as, you know, maritime borders, we also have horrid, horrid, horrid traffic. Top five, in terms of, you know, the worst traffic ever globally, and um, some public officials actually have used and worked with us and used the data to actually provide um, either incentives or um, do a policy with regard to traffic regulation based on data. So we can see uh, people um, or po policy makers start embracing this, yet at the same time, they're also scared. The way we handle data privacy um, are now at the border of whether they want to allow innov innovations or whether they do not allow innovations. The way they, uh, online transportation, for example, um, the way they um, have to handle uh, some of the new stuff like, um, you know, um, um, startups, embracing startups, um, and those startups that probably are not coming from Indonesia, crossing borders, are also very different. So this is a, a, an area where policy makings are also changing. Uh, government are trying to change Government is always slower uh, than private sectors, that's taken. Um, and for us at the Asia Society and alumnus and delegates, it's a great opportunity to actually play a role in that as well. Great, thank you. Philip, on, on the, yeah. as someone bringing technology and, you know, we just talked about, you know, heard about Alibaba, congratulations. Um, uh, bringing the best companies, creating the most innovative jobs, educating the workforce for the next generation, creating those startup companies. Um, what are the challenges? You know, we just heard about the gap between the public sector uh, and technology companies. You're, you're right at the crux uh, of that in a region that has not only you know, historically great many American companies that used to be here, but, but also Chinese and other companies. Uh, really uh, rushing in. So um, how do you see the challenge uh, and how ready is, is you know, Melbourne and uh, Victoria and Australia for this? Yes, yeah, so it's an interesting question. Can I, so when uh, Philip introduced me uh, and said that I was trying to do my best, uh, I'm not sure that he was meaning to uh, be unfair, but uh, I am trying to do my best, but I think we're doing pretty well. <laughs> so in the last two years, we've seen Slack, Square, Zendesk, Etsy, Eventbrite, GoPro, uh, hired or choose Melbourne for their Asia Pacific headquarters. Uh, and for some of them, they had millions of dollars thrown at them by Singapore in particular, uh, and they still chose Melbourne. And they chose Melbourne for a range of reasons. Uh, one, of course, is that Victoria uh, produces more IT grads than any other jurisdiction in Australia. We account for nearly 38% of all IT grads in Australia. New South Wales uh, is at 27% and Queensland is at 17 So we've got a pipeline of people. Uh, we, as uh, hopefully many of you experienced in your time here, we are an extraordinarily multicultural society. Not without our problems, but 
we are very, very accepting, very tolerant, uh, and we celebrate uh, cultural and linguistic differences. So in the case of Slack, for example, uh, as they were looking to grow their uh, support teams for uh, the Asia-Pacific region, ex-Japan, uh, because they have a very specific uh, function in Japan itself, uh, they wanted to touch in and, and uh, be able to take advantage of uh, our linguistic uh, opportunities or, or, or uh, in terms of um, uh, people with um, multiple languages. I myself speak Thai. My, my older sister learnt Bahasa. Uh, so, you know, the next generation, as we, you know, we talk about, uh, my children, by the way, are learning Korean in their primary school. So this is a fundamental change that we've seen in Melbourne. That's one of the ways that we, we, we help people. But can I say something that, that may be a little bit confronting or actually uh, for some people probably uh, quite, uh, quite actual in its uh, analysis, but... Technology can be taught anywhere. Uh, coding can be taught anywhere. We've brought coding into primary schools as of next year. Uh, we started with primary schools and then we'll bring it forward because the children now need to be given those skills. But the one thing that we need to be teaching our children, and it doesn't matter what nationality they are, uh, is uh, resilience, adaptability, flexibility. Because the world of tomorrow is very different from the world that I grew up in, very different from the world that my parents grew up in. And so one of the things that I often say, uh, James, is when my father, who's uh, just turned 80 and obviously retired for some time, when he grew up, if he had worked in more than one company and in one industry, he would have been seen as a failure within his community. Now, he ended up working for three companies in one industry because uh, one of the companies was in Greece uh, and then my mother met him and told him or convinced him that his future w was out here in Australia. And so he had then two companies here, one of which was a chartered accounting firm, and then the second company was one of the clients of the chartered accounting firm. So you can see he didn't go very far. But there are studies that show that my children will, on average, probably change jobs every 18 months and probably work in about 17 different industry sectors. That's pretty confronting for some of us. 17 different industries across their lifetime. So if... If we're not building that resilience, that adaptability and that flexibility into our children today, they won't be able to cope with what tomorrow brings. And so from my perspective as a public policy maker, that's something that is absolutely fundamental to society being able to, to adapt to the changes. And then the, the last thing that I'll, I'll, I'll mention is the, this issue of uh, disruption. Uh, it is a buzzword. Uh, and it's quite ridiculous. Uh, the world has been suffering from disruption uh, forever and a day. Uh, we didn't come today by a horse and buggy, although we've got a few around Melbourne. Uh, they're, they're more of a tourist, uh, more of a tourist thing. But, but jokes aside, uh, we saw the Industrial Revolution of the early 1900s and what that meant. We saw the development of the, obviously, the automobile. Uh, my father, by the way, and just to, 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 to round off this example, my father worked on the major passenger ferry between uh, Europe and Australia, Chandris uh, Shipping Lines uh, was its name, and it brought most of the Greek and Italian migrants out to Australia in the 50s and 60s. Well, people mostly will catch a plane these days. Uh, so, again, this, this notion of technology and disruption has ever been thus. Uh, we've seen it in every sector and every industry. AI, machine learning is going to be uh, another extent of that. Uh, does it concern me? Of course it does. But again, you bring that resilience back in and then you can start to see that from a public policy perspective, you can adapt uh, and you can change. And then skills and training is the last element of that. And, and as a government, we don't do that well at the moment, we do the skills and training well, mm. but we don't do the fact that people will be changing jobs well. So at the moment, uh, here in Australia, uh, you will get uh, access to a skill or training program uh, subsidised by the government. Then if you go and do something else, it will become a full fee paying program. As a government, we will need to change the way that we do that. We can't allow ourselves to try and put these barriers up 
in front of people if they're going to need to retrain and reskill themselves in different areas uh, to succeed. Great. Well, you know, I, I've been living in Silicon Valley for the last five years, and uh, and I've noticed actually, uh, actually, particular Slack is a great example of uh, many companies deciding to be in Melbourne, uh, and uh, and I was always wondering, you know, how how I was seeing so many more examples because it used to be a Singapore used to be the default place. You know, people didn't really think about it and just say, okay, we're going to move to uh, Singapore, and uh, and and now today I, I know. Who caused that to happen? So that's pretty, uh, pretty well, impressive. So, Congratulations. So, so cost of business is a big one, yeah. and uh, and the cost of business for, for Melbourne is much cheaper in comparison to Sydney, Brisbane, and Singapore, mm -hmm. and and so uh, it, it's quite ironic because people think, oh, Brisbane's this little town, but it, if you try and get CBD rental uh, per square meter, it's cheaper here in Melbourne than Sydney and Brisbane, and so when the labour cost, the cost of living. Uh, the cost of labour acquisition, uh, and I'm not talking about uh, about recruitment process, I'm talking about bringing people in. Uh, it's a much easier place to do business. And then, of course, we need to try and make it even easier. The, the world of global talent uh, can go anywhere. And uh, Philip talked about uh, Alibaba. There has been no greater example uh, in commerce uh, or in society at large of a business that has disrupted government. So everyone hears governments talk about free trade bilateral trade agreements. Well, Alibaba has rendered bilateral trade agreements uh, null and void. Uh, you can be in Melbourne and order something from Shenzhen to be delivered to San Francisco uh, as part of your business uh, process. And so as a government, we need to respond to that. Uh, we need to be able to take advantage of that and I think we're doing a pretty good job in Melbourne. And then the last thing I just want you to know, we don't compete with Sydney. Uh, Sydney's done. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm truly being serious. There has not been one company that we've lost out to uh, with Sydney. Uh, the competition is right throughout the Asia-Pacific region. And it's like companies. If a company thinks that their, their market is where they are physically located, then I'm, I, I will show you a company that will be dead within 24 months. Uh, and I say this to small businesses in particular because I also have the small business portfolio, that just as their market is now open up around the world, their competitors around the world are able to take their customers locally. So again, it requires a different mindset, a different approach, and it requires that of government as much as it does from the private sector. Great, thank you. Um, Paul, uh, you're right in the center of this change. Um, one of the most striking uh, experiences that I've had is uh, I was uh, with an AI data science person in a party in, uh, in, in, in Silicon Valley about six years ago. Uh, and, uh, and, and he'd been working there in like 25 years. Uh, and, and he walked in. He's like a real geek, uh, as you were describing. Uh, and, uh, and someone at the party said, you know, what, what do you do? And he said, uh, you know, machine learning. And, and like three people around just turned around and said, ooh, sexy. <laughs> and and he's, he said like that was the first time someone said that, you know, he, he was like this kind of sexy guy. But six years ago, that was when really, uh, I think, um, although the field is a very long one uh, and, uh, and there's been many ups and downs, uh, we've been really seeing machine learning reshape pretty much uh, every sector. Uh, you're right in the center of it. You've been at, uh, you know, Quaid, you're now at Salesforce. Uh, how do you see that engine really shifting things today? And where is that going? Right, good question. And um, I think it's important to note, even you mentioned it, that this is really the, not the first, not the second, this is the third time That's right. that AI machine learning has been sort of at the top of the hype cycle. Okay, so this started like back in the 50s, mm -hmm. where like Alan Turing, you know, the, of the Turing machine, you know, actually said, um, uh, you know, the, the, the time that a, a machine can essentially replicate um, human interactions through natural language, that would be the, the, the coming of AI. And that was in the 50s. Um, and from there, you know, there's this big investment in, in, uh, in, in AI. It kind of crested around, I think, probably about the, the 70s. There was another big, big pop in AI around, like, the 80s, and that, that sort of cooled down. And so that, we're in the third generation of AI. Um, and so the question invariably is then, well, you know, is this time different? Or is it, is it essentially just another hype cycle? And um, in my opinion, being, being based in the Valley, I'm a little bit in a, in a bubble. Um, 
But I think there is some fundamental differences this time around. Um, and it's really sort of based on three pillars. Uh, the first really is um, just the sheer amount of data that we have today. You know, I think something that was limiting uh, previously in, in, this, in the first two evolutions was that a lot of the data that was collected was human generated. You know, when it's human generated data, you're inherently capped in how much you can actually, you know, uh, how much data is, is available. And given the nature of these machine learning algorithms, they're really being trained on data. So the more data you have, the more accurate, the more powerful they become. Um, but now with the, uh, the emergence of IoT, with sensors and internet of everything, uh, the amount of data that we're collecting is just off, off the scales. It's just it's sheerly incredible. Um, so that's one. The, the second is, is the, the impact of um, processing. Um, so previously, you know, a lot of uh, the, the, the CPUs, the processes that we'd have in our, our servers handled things in, in very serial fashion, in sequential fashion. Um, this changed about the, in the early, about 2000, when NVIDIA um, launched the GPU, um, which basically, if you have the GPU is a graphic processing unit, this is something that um, was uh, enabled for gaming. So when you think about, like, when you're playing video games, high graphic video games, the, the way that those actually work is because they're rendering pixel by pixel, like, constantly, like, the frame rate is incredible. And so that, it, in order for that to happen, you need to have, like, really high parallel processing. And so NVIDIA created this um, graphics processing chip um, Andrew Ng from, from Stanford, he's like, uh, I guess, the machine learning guru, um, about in 2004, 2005, uh, you realized that you could actually use these, these, these GPUs that were used for, um, uh, you know, video gaming. You could actually train neural networks on those. And we can talk a little bit about what neural networks, networks are if you've, if you've sort of heard of that term. But that enabled a huge explosion of com computing power, right? So then now you could actually have this distributed computing across these, like, really powerful chips. And I guess that's, and so that's the second. So basically the first was just an explosion of data Second is like the, the, inc the incredible increase in parallel processing. And then third really is like the algorithms that are fueling all of this. And so if you think about it, like um, if you think about uh, so machine learning, AI, as basically, you know, this is a machine that's moving forward. Well, the, the, the fuel that, that is the data and the algorithms and the processes are really the engine, right? And so, um, and these algorithms, as I said, you know, before, these have been like over 50, 60, 70 years of research in the making. Um, and so now we're really standing on the shoulders of giants here. Like basically all of this academic research that was basically pre previously only possible through labs, um, now that's actually available through open source AI. So you can just plug into any, like, any of these algorithms that are trained by Google, by you know, Facebook, or just by like, you know, academic inst institutions. And now that is basically at the fingertips for any, any like, developer who's basically spent a, you know, um, a bit of time, you know, a few weeks, a few months, just learning the basics of machine learning. So, this has just led to an explosion. And so for, based on those three things, I think there is fu something f quite fundamentally different about this, uh, this wave of, of machine learning. And so, um, yeah, and hopefully we can get a little bit more into the implications of that as well. I mean, Philip, you sort of mentioned before, like the, the nature of people changing jobs every 18 months. I like to say that, um, you know, sort of in Silicon Valley, sometimes we like to think that we're, we live in the future, but I've been changing jobs every 18 months as well. So <laughs> in your like, uh, attention span, if it's something, you know, just a bearer of the future. And so... Um, but yeah, there's definitely going to be a lot of disruption, um, whatever definition, you know, we, we use for that. Um, and it's important that we're, um, you know, as, 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 I guess, young leaders, as policymakers, that we're prepared for those. Great. Well, actually, actually Paul, that was a fantastic uh, introduction. And, uh, and for those of you who haven't followed Andrew Ning's um, uh, work at Stanford, it's, uh, it's truly uh, uh, been pioneering. And, uh, and one of the things that for us today, you know, our conversation today, uh, that brought, uh, particularly, I think, Stanford machine learning community, uh, you know, that woke them up, was when Andrew moved to um, Baidu. Uh, and, uh, you know, he had been at Google. He had uh, run major labs at Stanford. He had uh, formed Coursera, which is a major educational platform. So he was a very well-known, respected person. Uh, and then when he uh, became the chief data scientist for uh, Baidu uh, out of Stanford, it was a real wake-up call. Uh, that uh, the major Chinese and Asian companies uh, had now really uh, come to the frontier of competing for talent. Uh, and his, his rationale was very simple, and it was based on um, what was just mentioned, which is that the data is the fuel. And when you look at a single language search volume, uh, although Google has the largest kind of multi-language search volume, if you just look at like Chinese language search, that's the single largest volume of search data available. So he just used that to train a lot of the things. And, um, and so we're seeing now uh, markets being penetrated and competed by many, many companies, but also talent. 
really being at, um, uh, you know, I think people fighting for that talent uh, throughout the region. Um, Bernice, uh, we're learning every day the new things that you can do and the breadth of work you do. But I, I think you know, it's actually appropriate that you're kind of at the end of this in the sense that you're now working with many companies uh, and also governments uh, and other stakeholders about kind of um, changes in societies that will happen uh, because of technology and getting those stakeholders ready uh, in that new way. Well, I, we talked about different like stakeholders as we were kind of going through. Uh, when you look at how that comes together and what different stakeholders need to be doing, what are you seeing, what are the challenges, uh, and what should we be working on? Well, that's like three questions in one. <laughs> um, that's a big question. It's a very relevant and timely one. You know, the work that we do is, is really as far away from uh, immediately providing solutions um, uh, right off the bat, right? Uh, Einstein said, apparently, that if you give me a problem, uh, if you give me an hour to solve a problem, I would take 55 minutes to understand it and then five minutes to solve it. Mm. And uh, the way it's been going in international development, kind of my space, um, is it's the opposite. It's been flipped around. They put... Uh, 95% of the energy into the execution or the implementation and 5% of the energy into the problem definition, the understanding of the research. Um, and there's a bit of like the politics of procurement around this as well because research and understanding and analysis is less visible, it's less action-oriented uh, and then doesn't look as nice in the reports. Right? And then in, and if we practice empathy for the poor you know, procurement officer in the World Bank or the UN, um, they have their higher-ups to answer to as well. So it's, it's an entire sort of system um, that's kind of holding these forces uh, in place. And one of the, diff the big differences, I think, uh, between international development and, say, the startup world, technology, um, is that in an international development, there are a couple of key gatekeepers. So it's not as if you can just like, produce a really good... Uh, method or really good app or tool and the market will, will speak for itself, right? Because the funding is controlled by these major uh, gatekeepers. And so, one, I mean, there are pockets within the field where there are interesting things uh, emerging like lean data and lean startup method um, and design thinking, which like, you know, every mom, daughter and their cat is like doing as well. But, okay, but that's in my space because I'm... I'm kind of very plugged in, into that little pocket and I'm just acknowledging that that's a very small proportion of the entire field that's still very slow to change. Mm. Um, and so now when we look at navigating the future where it's going to be different for some of the reasons that kind of we've alluded to on, the, on this panel and also in the last couple of days um, is that the kind of change that we saw before in the last five decades or even seven decades um, seems like it's going to be a, a, a qualitatively different shift. Um, and well, okay, quantitatively as well, just in terms of the, the amount of uh, data that will need to be grappled with in order to make sense of problems, um, the number of variables that, that uh, will need to be taken into account for any given project, right? Um, and all of the uh, trickle down and, yeah, all, all of the ripple on effects of that in a larger system. So one of the things that we do, um, and we think that many, it would benefit many uh, policymakers and, and governments to do as well, and even those gatekeepers like DFID, uh, World Bank, UN, um, is to look at divergent approaches um, to open up their imagination on what possible alternate futures there might be. If you don't know what world you're charting towards, how do you make that chart? How do you make that strategy and plan? Um, so foresight studies is like a, a whole field and like one of the, the, the tools that seems quite compelling is, is scenario planning. I won't go into the details of that, but I mean, suffice to say that it's basically a, a, an attempt for mental model busting, right? So that you can like imagine anything from your very utopian future where everyone is uh, living in harmony with robots and we don't need to work, it's the age of leisure, we're all covered by universal basic income and we can pursue the arts and music, my jazz, um, <laughs> to like really dystopian dark possibilities of, you know, class struggle, um, 
differentiated uh, human enhancement because you have you have resources and I don't, so I have to I have to uh, use my my time and my personal data as a as a surf for the the companies that are producing the the tech and like need more of our personal data for for all the rest of us the 99% uh, in order to like continue right so there is such a gamut of different possible futures how how do you possibly um, decide that, okay, we are going to do this, this is the 20-year plan, or the 10-year plan, five-year plan, um, and, and go there, right? So that piece is often missing um, in, in, the, in that sense-making. Um, but the other is really just good old problem understanding. Um, you know, if we did a bit more systems analysis, and of course, this is the work I do, but it's precisely because it's the work I do that I recognize its, its relevance. Um, before you uh, implement the, the solution of, you know, you know, rolling out this new tech system or um, a, a new healthcare, you know, solution, whatever it is. I mean, there's so many different things you can adopt in the different um, domains that are under the different ministries, which, by the way, a, a lot of our issues are also different government agencies not talking to each other in the silos, um, not... The silos being there is a very simple, well, simple in the sense that it's, it's not chaos and complex kind of realm, but it's like complicated. It's like an engineering thing. You can put the pieces together and, um, and, and solve that. Right. Some of these basic things, um, if we have that in place or I'll start practicing it, uh, it builds our muscle to better make sense of uh, many, many, many more ambiguous futures. Um, so these are a couple of the things that uh, I think are just like mindset shifts uh, that, that could be helpful. Well, super helpful. Um, I want to make sure that we started a little bit late, but I want to make sure we capture the questions. Um, I think, you know, broadly um, we heard uh, about increase, massive increase in data, um, real increase in like processing power uh, and then advancement in algorithm uh, uh, really driving change originally in the software industry but now as you know um, someone said like software is eating the world so all the sectors uh, are being connected through data and that change is transforming the world and, and I think you know the last point about like foresight and scenarios is extremely important because people with different scenarios have dramatically different prospects of what the future might be, and some are very resisting uh, of that change. And, and, you know, in some cases, quite rightly so, uh, in terms of um, society's readiness to change it. Uh, but, but many societies are also choosing to have that foresight and move forward. Uh, and, and I think uh, for our next generation, tremendously important uh, to be at the forefront of it. I, I just want to open it up, um, raise your hands. I want to collect a few questions. Uh, if you could also mention who you'd like to answer. We have six speakers. So I don't want like one question and like six things because then we'll be done with just like two questions. So uh, raise your hands. I'm just going to collect like two or three comments. Yes, just kind of maybe going down the front row here. And, like I see three hands here. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, th thanks very much, uh, panel. Uh, James, we, we discussed a little, this, a little bit about this. So one of my question is that I think you, you know, from working in government and now in a large banks, I think actually there's a lot of uh, parallels in a problem. I think also one of the catchwords is digital transformation, changing organization to adapt to new technology. And one of the key issues that came up is sort of the intergenerational gap that happens in organizations. So you have at the senior level, the, the, the juniors who are you know, where innovation lies, they know the technology, they, they're very much up to speed and they want to push for change. But the people at the top who are the MDs, the, I'm not MD by the way, um, who are MDs or, or senior level management who are you know, not uh, used to all the technology change have two problems with adopting new technologies. One is that they fear that this could go wrong and that they're in trouble ruin their career. And two is that even if it succeed at organization or good for the country, it's not in their interest because it could then put themselves out of work and obsolete. So I view as crucial our generation, which is sort of in middle, born digital, uh, not born digital, but grow up with the digital technology. So my question is that, which is sort of broadly anyone who want to uh, uh, you know, weigh on this, 
is, you know, what, what do you think should be our role, our generation, which is sort of stands in between? How do we incentivize the adoption at the top? How do we get everyone on board on the same boat so that we can drive things forward? Great. I, I'll collect a few other and, and we'll find a person. Uh, yes. Hi. Uh, to the whole panel, uh, I guess what I want to ask is, are you guys worried about the shift in conversation with respect to uh, how technology is disrupting democracy is not in a good way and how that might uh, shape regulatory frameworks across the world and that's a that's a question better for our american friend yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a question for everyone I mean, like you great okay yes um, yeah, absolutely. I had a question for Diane. Is that how you? Shinto. Um, so you mentioned transparency in one of your comments, and I was just to address some of the frustrations I have as a researcher. Is you know after the establishment of e-governments, putting everything on the internet uh, under the name of transparency, I face more and more difficulty accessing data, and uh, also on e-voting, e-elections. So just as an example, uh, South Korea had a president impeached last year, and uh, it turns out the, the election could have been rigged. Everything is electronic election. Uh, there's a system for electronic voting in South Korea, and it will be exported to Iraq for parliamentary elections next year. But what we fear is by spreading this technology to other parts of the world, the same kind of disaster could be repeated in different places. And um, so going back to the data uh, access, um, I think the more a government, let's say United States, Korea, Japan, advocate for transparency, the lesser data is available to the public. Even under the Freedom of Information Act in the United States, you can't get access to USTR trade agreements or negotiation details uh, that are uploaded on the internet. And the reading rooms that are traditional are being closed down. So do you have a, a path uh, at Google Indonesia? Indonesia, for example, if you're doing something related to election or voting or any kind of mechanism you're coming up for the government, do you have some kind of means to counter this kind of side effect or externality? Okay, so maybe, maybe this is, that's a direct question. Why don't we pick up that question okay. first and then we'll go to the other questions. Yes, do you have a microphone? Yes, go ahead, please. Uh, the direct answer to that is that no, at Google we don't have the answers to that. If that, if we do, then probably things would have changed at the mothership first, um, and it hasn't. Um, but um, I completely agree with you. Um, I think we are at this juncture uh, where this could go either bad or either you know really really good. But what I've noticed, um, at least in some of the countries that I've worked, is that we're going to reach an equilibrium as well. Um, I think one of the things that's really good coming up is now we understand that the e-voting, the way it's being done, can be a rig. And so the antidote are already in the process of being made. And I think that's, that's the good thing. The antidote is coming really, really fast because of the proliferations of the, uh, the data processing and everything. So just because it's rigged in one place, the next generations, the 2.0, the 3.0, could be better. Um, I also uh, realize that um, this is really, again, depends on the policy makers. Some policy makers, they like putting the data out there and they continue um, putting more data out there. Uh, the examples of the um, of the Indonesian uh, governor for Jakarta, which is the most trafficked uh, cities, and how they continue building up data to improve the policy making and the public budgeting as well. They put it out there so that people can actually scrutinize them, and it's actually helped because uh, it was the first time uh, that um, the ex-governor uh, has an approval rating of seventy percent. 
uh, and that's because he put so much data out there and he continues doing that. It is in other uh, part of uh, government, especially the national government, it doesn't happen. Um, the, the, the maritime uh, and the fisheries minister, it, ha uh, it happened. She continues putting out more data, which is, and I think that's one of the reasons that draws um, other countries to also pull the data so that they would know uh, the illegal fishing and they would know which ship is actually not registered in the countries um, and actually going uh, across border. Uh, but at the same time, uh, Trade Ministry, for example, um, they put out the data, but it's always an obsolete, uh, an obsolete data. Um, so in terms of the offer side, uh, either from the President's office uh, down, is usually not really that good. So I think we're looking into uh, uh, some issues here. Uh, one, uh, we're looking into the issues of, um, you know, uh, the readiness of each of the office are very different. And second, this is the part where um, people like us and you know, like myself, which is an advocate for digital transformation, so to speak, to actually talk that there's nothing to be feared and to create a system um, or you know uh, something where we can, where they can be comfortable um, in sharing those data. Great. Um, actually, on the on the first uh, question, uh, Philip, if you if you could um, pick that up, I, th I think the question really uh, um, broadly is is about society accepting change and the generational challenge. In particular, I think that you know the role of the middle generation. But when you bring the companies in, uh, sometimes embedded in that may be the social change. Uh, so, how so, do you how do you cope with that? Well, I mean, we we've got a very live example right now. So. Uh, the automotive industry has now shut down in Australia. And, and so we have lost uh, about 2,500 uh, workers direct uh, in Victoria across both Ford and Toyota. And then if you look across the whole of the supply chain, our estimation is it's around 34,000, uh, including uh, manufacturers, uh, Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3, uh, and then businesses that serve them also. You can't go into uh, an assembly plant and tell them that bringing slack to Melbourne is going to uh, help them get a new job. Uh, so the first thing it needs is honesty, uh, which is a rare trait for politicians. Uh, but we need to be able to have a very open and honest conversation. So I will often say to these people that what we are doing may not actually help them but what we are doing will help their children. And so it takes a little bit of anxiety away from them in terms of the fear of what technology or innovation brings. Mm. We had a, a, a very celebrated example in our federal election of last year in, in uh, the period of May and June. The, the, the election was the beginning of July, but the campaign was in May and June, where the Prime Minister spoke of innovation at the beginning of the campaign and within a few weeks of the campaign starting, the Prime Minister stopped speaking of innovation for the rest of the campaign. It wasn't a failure of innovation or technology, it was a failure of selling the message that people don't need to be fearful of technology but we need to be able to embrace it and maximise and, and take advantage of it. And he never talked about it in terms of the jobs that it would bring. Uh, in terms of the opportunities it would foster. And so for me, when I have that opportunity, I always talk about uh, very real uh, examples of jobs that we've brought in that demonstrate that innovation is not some ephemeral concept that's going to destroy society as we know it. Mm. Can I just talk about data, though? Mm. Two quick points. Sure. Uh, there's no doubt that through Southeast and North Asia, democracy is... Uh, a concept, uh, a concept that is implemented to varying degrees. That's not a criticism because uh, democracy as we know it, even in Western democratic countries like the United States and Australia, uh, result in strange outcomes from time to time. Uh, we've seen people uh, vote in democracies uh, and, of course, uh, uh, the outcomes of that, Brexit, uh, we still don't have a government in Germany. 
uh, obviously the uh, election of President Trump in the United States. Uh, we have outcomes that sometimes challenge the notion of whether democracy is actually uh, a, an appropriate form of governance. And so data will do one of two things. We've seen the interference in the United States election uh, by, by Russian uh, um, agents. Uh, we've seen the concern uh, about intervention in Korea. Uh, you know, these are, these are very live examples, and as our, I can tell you our government is already discussing what those implications are for us uh, as well. So I believe that more data should be out in the open, not less. It does bring serious concerns about how you then mine that data uh, to be able to get the information that you need, because, of course, the more data that you dump, uh, the harder it is to sift through to get what you want. The opposite, of course, is true of companies like Google. Uh, there will come a time when uh, companies, uh, and I'm, by the way, I'm not suggesting that, that Google is one of them, uh, set up their operations to maximise their data for all of the wrong reasons. Uh, and so government and society will have to make decisions as they develop about uh, what they give and who has control or ownership of it. Whether it be health data uh, and the ability to go from a different doctor to a different doctor and own your records. So, for example, just to, to tell you, in, in Australia, your local medical practitioner, your GP, owns your medical history. If you go to a, a general practice, they own your record. You can ask for a copy of it, but if they sell their practice to another doctor, that data stays with them. But how do we then, as a government, make sure that people own their own data, but also control their own data at the same time. So public, that's, a, that's an example from a health public policy point of view, but the private, right, how many people when you're looking at a shop, uh, as I do for golf clubs, and then I go to my news website and all of a sudden there are advertisements for golf clubs next to the newspaper article that I'm reading. Right? The algorithms today are ridiculous. Uh, they are so clever that they, uh, they take and track your data. And so uh, with no disrespect to Google, I use the Google Incognito browser from time to time. I pr predominantly now use Firefox Focus. Uh, so I don't have to think about have I actually chosen Incognito or not. Uh, because of course, this is a serious concern. And then of course, the last thing is in terms of democracy. Um, if we go right back to when democracy began, uh, forgive me for giving you a little bit of my Greek uh, Hellenic background. The very nature of democracy, it was, the Greeks have been dining out on what they did 3,000 years ago. Unfortunately, they've never gone forward from that point in time. Uh, so the, the very nature of demos and kratos was literally people gathering together and making decisions, literally in the street. We, I, I suspect by the time I'm old and grey, I know I look very young, it's not so far away. <laughs> I suspect that we will return, that technology will allow citizens to have a much greater say in the role of their governments than what we do today. Uh, because technology will allow people to literally be able to choose what they want their elected officials to do or not to. Now, uh, can I just finish on elections? Uh, I have very strongly advocated against electronic voting. Despite my love of technology, uh, it is a very dangerous pathway. Uh, when you have a sheet of paper, uh, you can demonstrate what somebody has done. Uh, technology is such that you can have a non-network system and still have infiltrated the program. And so uh, I, I can't foresee any opportunity or change, even with uh, the development of blockchain, that will ever satisfy me that an, an electronic voting system can be built in a secure way without any b ability to be compromised whatsoever. Right. I, I think it partially... Uh, I, yes. 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 Yes.
Uh, I just have a very quick response to the first question. I really love that one. I I really want to say that, just get rid of the senior generation, but I realize, okay, I shouldn't say that. It's a bad fetal education, so. <laughs> but uh, my, my quick answer would be, uh, I think because we are talking about this inside the Asian society, I don't know whether you guys share similar culture as I do in, in China. We have sort of this kind of control, parental culture that you want everything to be like predictable and control controllable. But it, it seems to me right now with the technology, we are actually living under the biological principle. That means, like I want to borrow your word, adapt to the changing environment. And that actually means, uh, I, actually I'm being considered as senior in my company, so. But we are supposed to be the coach rather than the one actually doing things, carry out things. So I think the role has changed. Can I quickly chime in as well? Like, uh, <laughs> we're not going to get through these questions. But um, actually, interesting about, about the, um, the, the hacking of electronic um, voting. There's actually a recent study that um, they opened up the state uh, voting system to, to hackers, like, and the lab at MIT. Guess how long it took them to hack the system, like, with their algorithm? It's like less than a minute. It was crazy how easy it was to, to hack. So I think there's certainly a lot of risk there. Um, in terms of the intergenerational question, I think it's important to note um, a couple of things. Firstly, that te technology is great, absolutely great at solving some of our problems and issues. And it's also really good at creating new ones. But that's just the nature of progress, isn't it? And so, um, and so I guess and then it comes to, I think, uh, although I don't really have to, um, for better or worse, probably better, don't have to deal with like um, incumbent uh, sort of cantankerous old people <laughs> that are resistant to change. But um, the, I think, you know, I mean, it always comes back to it, isn't it? It's like sort of empathy. It's like, what are they concerned about? And I, I sort of think about, like, with our, our customers, like, you know, they're excited about machine learning and AI, but they also, like, fear it. There's a lot of concern about, you know, what are the, what the black box that it sort of opens up. Um, and, you know, some of their concerns might be, like, you know, cyber threats. Some of the concerns might be regulatory. You know, how do we, how do we um, adhere to um, and comply with GDPR? other, you know, right to be forgotten type um, regulations. And, and, you know, understand, as, a, as, I guess, someone who's trying to enable that change, it's um, understanding what those concerns are and, and placating them. But I think that's similar with, with uh, um, you know, with the work that you do in, in, in government and society, although perhaps on a much broader scale. I mean, some of the questions that you raised, like, you know, um, what, what, what about all these people that, you know, that are no longer employed um, in these, um, like, manual tasks? Um, you know, what about the retraining? Who's going to pay for the retraining? Is that going to be public? Is it going to be private? Is it going to be shared? Um, what's, what about, like, you know, um, social safety net? All of these questions that have to be asked, I think, um, of a different nature, but certainly I think it comes back to it. Like, what are, you know, what are, what's the source of those concerns? All right. Um, I think we're, we have time for like, two more questions, uh, and then I'll probably have to wrap. Um, any, any additional questions? To the part? Only captured the question. So Eugene, uh, one more uh, somewhere? Uh, yes. Hi, I actually have a question for the minister and also for Shinto, if that's all right. Okay. Um, okay. Really, um, Tanya here from Sydney, uh, really interested in how you bring together um, the innovation technology and, you know, Shinto, you're talking about preschools, but also with the education system. And so in government, how are you working across portfolios to make sure the things that you're doing it sort of in the present gets translated into what we need to teach our children so that they're ready for the future? And I know that governments typically, you know, the portfolios are very separate. So how do you work across portfolios to make that change, particularly when you've got um, the other older generations or teachers' unions and things like that, so that the change in the education system happens quickly enough? Okay, so uh, I'll be really uh, quick. Can, can I just collect? Yeah, uh, collect you want to collect? Yeah, first? Collect. Um, Eugene, yes. Uh, hi, Eugene e from Boston. Um, I'm... So excited for the future. Uh, I think the, I think the future is going to hold. Um, uh, I think the future. I think even of search of Google is going to be um, kind of a mixture of what Paul you were saying about the quantify itself. I think uh, where uh, right now we type in uh, uh, like on, in a Google box like what what you want to look for. I think uh, with machine learning, um, I think one of the interesting futures that I see and anticipate is that we'll soon start to have enough data about ourselves that 
the way that we search will be like, oh, I lost my keys. So when was the last time I did this motion? And you, you search by, by motion, or you search by your own semantic graph of when was the last time I said something to, to Emily? And, uh, and have that data that's, that's my data that I'm able to find patterns and recognize stuff off of. Um, and I think in that, in that, type, of, uh, in that type of future uh, where you get uh, interesting uses of personalized AI, personalized machine learning, um, I'm curious who the champions are. I see quick... I see governments that are um, quick to regulate. I don't think a lot of this innovation is going to happen in Europe because of data pri like very strict data privacy laws. Um, I think Australia is quick to follow suit uh, on, on a lot of those privacy laws. But I think Asia is going to be a very interesting place for innovation as long as the regulators uh, don't swoop in very quickly on, on data privacy. So uh, my question is to, I think... Uh, it's a mixture of both uh, for Philip as well as uh, for uh, maybe Shinto, um, where uh, who are the champions that we can see uh, that will allow this type of future? Like, who are the people within government? Uh, who are the people that we need to rely on as a community uh, to make sure that we have an exciting future uh, for uh, like networks like the Asia Society or uh, other international organizations that will be able to champion this uh, in a transnational cross-border way? Great. Well, I'm really excited about the future too, Eugene, because I'm pretty sure you're buying us all coffee at the break. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so that's so. Thank you very much. Uh, can, can I? You're all. You're all the champions. I'm not saying that uh, to make you all feel happy and think that I was a great speaker when you leave. But if you rely on government to champion uh, where we're going as a society you will be sorely disappointed. Uh, coming from Boston, uh, I was there September, October. I love Boston. It's an amazing place. It's got such a, a, an amazing and exciting uh, vibe around the farmer and the, the biotech precincts, which is why I was there. Uh, and, you know, I only scratched the surface of, of what Boston offers. But if you were wanting that kind of narrative from President Trump, then we're not going to have a long conversation. And, and I'm not saying that in a very disparaging way. I'm saying that in a very matter-of-fact way. So we need some people in politics and, and public life to stand up. But often uh, you actually need the people uh, across the community, the not-for-profit sector, the private corporate sector, to come together and push and challenge and drive that change. So... As flippant as I was about saying that I'm excited by the future, I'm excited by what all of you are bringing to the table, what all of you are challenging us. So you're all going to go back to your own countries at some point in time. Some of you will be living in different countries now and some of you will eventually uh, go back, whether it be for fleeting visits or for professional. And you will be able to take the wealth and the depth of your experiences back with you. Don't underestimate how powerful that is. That's, so that's the first thing. I don't know whether that satisfies uh, your, your uh, innate desire for, for politics, but then I'll come back to the, the original question uh, about uh, what we're doing. Can I tell you there is no magic key to Victoria's success. It is no different from the key to any private corporate success, and that's simply people. People drive positive change in any organisation they go. Silos will be built by people that try and contain or build their own power base uh, at uh, the expense of the collective. So how do we do it? Well, I've been a minister for nearly two and a half years. Uh, when I first started in my portfolio, I had responsibility for policy in relation to medtech and the health minister had responsibility for R&D institutions within the pharma space, and my industry colleague had responsibility for biotech. I now have responsibility for all three. But when I first became a minister, I went to the health minister and I said to Jill, Jill, there are times that I think I'm going to cross over from medtech into pharma or bio, and I apologise to you if I do, because at times I'm not sure where the lines blur as in where I'm crossing that line. And Jill's response to me was, Philip, go right ahead. And if I cross over into your territory, I apologise as well. So, again, 
in terms of that policy, we're working in a very collaborative way. And I think that's a, a shift in, in, in both generation in terms of uh, politicians, but also in terms of a desire to be focused on outcomes at the expense of trying to build uh, your own base together. And then, of course, uh, the Education Minister, James Molino, uh, I'm catching up with him later this morning, uh, he was the one that has pushed to have coding introduced into primary schools. And I've spoken to him about that. It's not my policy area, but I can speak to him and say, this is what I think we need to be doing. And he responds and, and moves forward with a policy, not because I've necessarily brought it to him, but he contemplates, he seeks advice from his department, and then they move. So this is, again, no different from, from any aspect of life, whether it be personal relationships or whether it be professional relationships in the public sector or in the private sector. It always comes down to people. Great. Um, move, and move to Melbourne. <laughs> <laughs> and, and enhance our people here as well. Yes. Shintai, do you want to... Just... Hi. Hi. I'm excited about the future as well. I'm actually really... Because, you know, like I'm kind of like move around a lot. So I'm, I'm actually all this time I was worried that I'm going to topple over. <laughs> so I'm just going to stand. Um, so yes, I'm really excited about the future. You asked about who is going to be the champion. Frankly, I don't know. Um, you know, and um, I've worked with the World Bank. I've worked with government. Now I work with Google. Um, and every time there is a new election, we always map out before the election who's going to be the champion after the election. And sometimes, you know, it all doesn't work out. You know, the people that we thought was going to be uh, the champion lost the election. Or they won the election, but then they, they turn into this some sort of like bureaucratic uh, person that, um, that, you know, wouldn't even hear about uh, progress or innovation at all. So I think, but, you know, the excitement part about it is that you find new champion. Um, and, um, and, and that's the exciting part because they're open to ideas and we brainstorm. And you know, like, like you said, Phillips, everything is about collaboration. So the first step is always building trust. Um, and that, you know, I'm not here to sell my product. Uh, good thing, you know, because um, our product is actually really user friendly. I don't have to sell the product. Most it's people, selling quite well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so we're lucky in that sense. Uh, but, you know, to begin with, I am also this generation, I'm also your voters or, you know, um, people who vote. Um, I'm also uh, wanting a better Indonesia. So we usually start the conversation from that. And I'm not here to propose a solution. I'm here to work with you if there is a solution. Or maybe there is no solution. Um, the, the rising case of Indonesia being highly sectarian, um, it's something that is also um, uh, uh, emotionally um, affect me. Um, but at the same time, I realize this has happened for a while. We need to find a root cause for this. Um, and there are uh, government officials who are open to that. There are plenty who doesn't. Um, the police, like, let's just, you know, put this, all these people into jail, and that's not how it works. And uh, you said, you know, if you want the narrative from the top, we have actually have a very progressive uh, president. Um, you saw Tom Lembong um, yesterday, and you heard him talking, um, you know, the day before. He's very progressive. And only if you have a progressive leader or boss, then you can be openly talking about this progress in such a way that he did. Uh, but at the same time, it's not enough just the narrative from the top. Because if the people one down below and three downs below, and if you're talking about Indonesia, it's 33 provinces, several steps below are not ready to embrace those change then there are more works that needs to be done. We can't just, I don't think Indonesia is going to go to e-voting um, anytime soon, for example. Uh, illiteracy is still a problem. Uh, how would you go to you know, e-voting? Um, and connectivity is even a bigger problem uh, in Papua, for example. Although we do have YouTuber that's in Papua, that's uh, videos going viral and have been watched for about 60 million times. Um, but at the same time, these issues persist. So facing it and doing it through stages for a country as big as Indonesia is important. And we are 
is that generations that would have to go through that because we have to bridge it because we can't just kill the generals. Um, um, and other older people. Why uh, did you look that way? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Is there any uh, health uh, sort of like innovations that would change their brain uh, works? Uh, but yes, uh, we need to be optimistic. We have to be optimistic. We are that generation that might that have the responsibility to change, but also bridging for the younger generation. Um, so I think that's my answer. Um, Great. Do you, you want to say something else? Um, I want to say something about the go education. Because uh, actually the preschool uh, work that we do, me and my friends does, for the first two years, our issue is malnutrition and um, you know, basic reading and writing. So we didn't touch anything on technology. And I think that's the great thing, because I've already started working for Google. And you know, to work on something I'm really passionate about with children or from underprivileged uh, you know, families, and not talking anything about technology, that's great. You know, no laptop, no you know, smartphone, no anything. And then we hit a point where we have so many preschoolers that actually this is the time where we need to start using technology so we can start mapping the area where there are so many of these preschoolers or you know, taught um, uh, age between four to six um, or three and a half to six that does not have enough clothes, have mites all over uh, their bodies, is sleeping next to rats. We do that uh, in some of the fishermen's villages. And you know we need to do this so that when we start talking with either local governments or even among our networks, we know what to ask and we know when to ask those. So, um, so hopefully that answers your questions. I'm happy to answer more after. Right, so I think we're running out of time. Um, oh, we've, just, got, we've got one more question at the back. Is that okay, Sanjeev? Can I just extend? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Shamir Rasuldin uh, from Sri Lanka. Um, I just want to drag your attention to this spying business because I've been a victim of spying, uh, government spying for many, many years. Uh, we're a country that I was... all like, the time we've got four. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> We are a country that was plaguing by ter terrorism for nearly th three decades. Uh, our movements, our phones were tapped. And now recently I was re re reading an article uh, and it said that Google uh, has been taking information from people. So where is a uh, digital revolution moving towards? Is it about getting access or movement of people? I um, directed this question to uh, Shinto, by the way. Uh, is this the future? Uh, is this what we're looking at? <laughs> Uh, because uh, we know there's a lawsuit right now in the United Kingdom against Google. Um, is this the future that we are envisaging? So Shinta, you're on the spot, please. Closing words. Google is on the spot. I'm never on the spot. <laughs> but, you know, like uh, I'm here with the Asia Society. I'm not representing Google. But, you know, a lot of government... <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Off, off, off the record conversation, please. I yeah. just happen to work there. But a lot of government is against uh, Google. A lot of governments is against Uber. Um, a lot of governments is against uh, innovation. And I think it would always be a, a play of, um, you know, um, catch, uh, catching up um, between government and technology companies. And I think this is the role where technology companies have to play. Um, oftentimes, technologies company, and this is just the nature of startups. You come in, you roll, you know, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, you take off. But uh, sometimes, um, and I think um, you've seen these changes as well, we need to build a better dialogue with government as well. And I think Silicon Valley um, and also other companies, um, especially Google is no longer classified as a startup, for example. Amazon is no longer classified as startups. And Alibaba is not getting into uh, that as well. Um, we start understanding the importance of building a good and trustworthy dialogue uh, with government. And I think um, this is a sort of like the path that you'll be seeing forward. Um, big technology companies start understanding that we need to educate, and this is like a very arrogant word to, to use as well, to educate um, policymakers that 
you know, not all progress needs to be implemented immediately. Shinto, maybe, maybe uh, just kind of, um, maybe mm -hmm. this is what he's asking, but um, it's one thing for Google, and I have tremendous respect for Google, but one thing for Google is to educate other people about potential of technology. But I think people have genuine concerns about these gigantic monopolies uh, where the voting right is actually held by a few founders mm. who are not publicly accountable, uh, who have you know, over $700 billion of cash, more than most governments, uh, to spend on things. So what gives us the reason to trust Mike, Larry, and Sergey uh, as the, you know, uh, this proportion of voting right owners of a massive company that owns most of our information to do it in a way that's accountable. What, where is the accountability and, and where does that go? Um, I think shareholders. Um, but, but the shareholders have no voting rights, like Sergey and Larry you hold most of the voting rights. And uh, eventually money, because if you see, if, if you see uh, Google has also gone through tremendous, I don't know why I'm defending Google, but because they pay your salary. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, yeah, but I think it's a legitimate concern, right? That, that, yeah. is, a, that is a legitimate yeah. concern. Yeah. And I think over the past decade, you've seen Google is also opening up. Uh, we hire Ruth Porrett, um, and now in terms of uh, how we report our financial transactions and our uh, financial earnings is also have changed. Um, I think it would... More disclosure. More disclosure. Mm. And I think it would permeate more and more. Um, and also, there is the tremendous pressures on Larry and Sergey not to abuse uh, their voting rights. Mm. Um, and I think this, um, this, this would eventually go because that's, to be honest, that's where the money is. And right. if they start abusing their uh, voting power, Google would lose its relevance. Yes, we probably is the monopoly in terms of some of our products, but it's not going to last forever if they start doing that. So, so can, I, can I put it back on you? It's your data. It's your information. You are in control of what you do and when you do it. Just as a show of hands, how many people up here, doesn't matter what it is, have uh, a stake in a loyalty program? Whether it be a frequent flyer program, whether it be a shopping loyalty program, right? You're giving your data away already. I do not use loyalty programs. I do not want supermarkets to know what I buy how much of it and on what frequency do I buy it? It's none of their business. But if you want to do that, that's fine. That's on you. But be aware that that's what you're doing. You are selling and giving away your data. Now, it's up to governments to try and regulate, no doubt. But it's also up to people to be able to be educated. And it's up to governments to do that, but it's up to society to do that as well. And so when you make a determination about who you give information or what, then, of course, at that point in time, you have control over your own future. Great. I just want to add something to that because you just posed the question back to me. Yeah. Um, okay. I think uh, it's only right if I uh, Keep it really answer short, that. honestly. Uh, so, so the recent allegation against Google is the fact that uh, even after you take off your chip from the phone, you still can track your uh, whereabouts. So is that something that uh, we want? Uh, now, I'm a journalist in Sri Lanka. If I want to disconnect a frequent flyer program, I'll disconnect. I don't want to be connected to it. So my data should be protected if that's the case. Well, so, I, don't, I don't know what phone you use. It might be a Pixel or it might not be now. Uh, but I can tell you that you have location services on your iPhone uh, and there are times that you can turn it off and there are times you can keep it going. Uh, everyone... Uh, wherever you go, CCTV cameras, uh, your electronic transactions by use of uh, credit or debit cards. There is the ability to track and data mine whatever you do. Uh, Google uh, is one example. It's a private company. Uh, they are collecting data. They sell that data through ads uh, on their search engines. Uh, that's how they make money. They're, they're entitled to do that. And if you give them your data, well, you're uh, participating uh, in their revenue streams. Now, should they be able to collect data after you've disconnected from them? That's a different story. And I dare say that, that if they do that, then they will face uh, antitrust and regulatory concerns right across the, the world. Uh, that will be an issue, not just for Google, by the way, but from any company that has a digital presence. 
Uh, so there are a range of issues and, you know, we're, we're finishing up and it's been an amazing discussion and I've learned, I've hope, I've learned as much as I hope that all of you have picked up from um, my other panellists, but there are, we haven't even talked about diversity uh, within uh, the tech sector and, and James, I, I dare say you could probably talk a little bit about it uh, from your experience in, in, in SF. We haven't talked about uh, the impact uh, that technology has played uh, in global uprisings uh, and what does it mean for democracies. And I'm not just talking politically, I'm talking about uh, the growth in the private sector and capitalism uh, and, and how that is redefining what we're doing. So um, we could probably have this panel over and over again and then we could have another panel on how do we regulate data and, and what should we be doing to regulate data. And should we be regulating data or should it be a free-for-all? And as long as people sign up and say, you are giving me your data, tick the box, then it's fine. But the last thing I leave you with is, the do you use an iPhone? Uh, no, I don't. Okay, which phone do you use? I use a Sony. A Sony. Okay, so when the software Android. updates on the Sony, Android you don't phone. like the terms and the agreements, do you write to Sony in Japan and say, clause 7.1b... I really want you to change that before I click to update my software. Of course you don't. So again, right, there are issues that governments have to consider about those types of privacy agreements because as consumers, uh, we have very little control uh, about what we do and how we do it. Very quickly, uh, Philip. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I, I just, I just can't get, really get over this. Yeah, yeah. See, okay, this happened in, okay, this happened in, in UK. <laughs> uh, you're a minister in Australia. I will stay back and <laughs> yeah. talk can, to can we just, yeah. I promise you. Honestly, I, I want to make sure that people get coffee. Uh, but ju just uh, final, final thoughts uh, that I was just noting down. Um, that you know, I think uh, we start talking a little bit about what we talked about and what we didn't talk about. I do think, uh, you know, this forum is really important. Um, one of the things I took away was, uh, you know, we do know about the tremendous potential that data and processing power uh, and algorithm presents. Um, I think we got a really good discussion about different scenarios uh, and foresights uh, and what we can do to better understand those different scenarios because uncertainty around that causes huge anxiety. I think what we were touching on at the end uh, about government and business is actually a really good topic. Uh, fundamentally, because I think the public trusts neither. You know, I think we had a conversation about great government uh, today and, and some that are not. Uh, but ultimately, we are seeing everywhere governments that are becoming more authoritarian uh, and, and willing to step in and use that data in a way that you know, some citizens don't know about. Uh, and then we also have companies which may be truly well-intentioned uh, but have chosen to use voting rights uh, that actually protect them even from shareholders. So actually we can't, you know, even if the shareholders, you know, share prices tank, there's very little we can do to Jack Ma uh, or Larry or Sergey uh, or, you know, Zuck uh, because they actually control the voting rights of these massive companies that hold most of our data. Uh, and so it's really up on, I think, you know, what we might call the public uh, and citizenry to really shape what's going on. And, and the two things I really took away was, one, um, next generation. Um, and it's very difficult for us to, in the current generation, to think of what's best for us. You know, we're in different positions. Some, some of us may gain tremendously, some of us may not. Uh, but I think uh, the notion of, you know, doing it for the next generation and bringing regulations to societies for them, I think, was a great anchoring uh, device uh, to really unite people, and I think that came up a lot of times. I think the second thing that really is relevant for this group is uh, uh, diversity, and, and, and I think um, Asia represents regulatory and kind of tech company diversity that you don't really see in any other region. We have you know, great tech companies, uh, different forms of government, different types of market, uh, and the more experiments uh, that we can do and more we can bring good examples to the world of what's working uh, that will create a more hopeful scenario and generate like examples that others can follow. I think uh, that'll be really important. And so uh, this community is really important um, and, uh, and I hope we can continue the discussion. But uh, thanks for taking the time. Sorry we went over. Uh, I hope there's time for coffee. Uh, but I want to thank all the panelists for a fantastic